Good morning. I'd like to welcome everybody this morning to the Stewart Church of Christ. I'd like to welcome our members and visitors alike. And at this time, I'd like to go over our, our uh, sick list. And we've got one addition. Uh, Kathy Owens is uh, sick this morning and can't be with us. Um, see, Dottie Tranum's uh, sister Rose has been diagnosed with breast cancer. Uh, Angie, the mother of Vicki Walbauer, is having heart issues. Tom McKinley is on home hospice care. Uh, the family requests no visitors at this time. April Schelt's friend, Janice Jobson, is in the hospital in Gainesville. Cheryl Barnes is at home uh, recovering from a broken hip. And she, she's doing better, is it? Okay. All right. Uh, Nelda Swiger is having tests. Alicia Solomon is having a procedure soon. Uh, Sarah Alcius is recovering from a knee replacement surgery. And uh, Doris Coleman's husband, Arlie, has stage four kidney cancer. Austin Petty will start radiation treatments next week. Mark Morris, a uh, friend of Debbie Smith, will have uh, surgery for cancer soon. Penny Carter, Sheena Sink's mom uh, has bladder cancer. Maria uh, Meline, a uh, friend of Ed Beatty, is going in the hospital for tests related to her frequent seizures. And finally, Natasha Sylvester's cousin, Natasha Sylvester's cousin, Owen, is on a ventilator. So we need to keep all these individuals and families in our prayers. Yes. Oh, okay. 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 All right. If you didn't hear that, Owen, uh, Natasha's cousin, is not doing well, and they're going to have a, a meeting Monday to find out what the next step is. So. All right, we'll keep all these individuals in our prayers, and uh, the end of service, I'll make some further announcements. Good morning. We will begin the morning worship service with number 851, Blue Skies and Rainbows, verses 1, 2, and 3. Blue skies and rainbows and sunbeams from heaven are what I can see. When my Lord is living in me, I know that Jesus is well and alive today. He makes his home in my heart.
Let's all pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for another good night's rest. We thank you for our church family here that we're so blessed to be able to just meet and, and have study, learn more about you. God, please be with all the ones that are sick, that are they're fighting cancer and corona and so many things. You know, you know who they are. God, be with them. If it be your will, just bring them back strong. And help us all do your will every single day. Keep you first. In Jesus' name, amen. In preparation of the Lord's Supper, we will be singing number 621. <laughs> Verses 1, 2, and 4, and we will only sing the chorus after the fourth verse. They church. We've uh, come to the portion of our worship service where we are commanded to reflect on the sacrifice that our Lord and Savior did for us. If, uh, if you're visiting with us or if you just uh, forgot this morning, we do have the communion cups in the foyer. If you neglected to pick one up, if you'll raise your hand, we'll have someone bring one to you. As I was trying to think of the words to say uh, before our communion, um, the term came to my mind that, in my opinion, I think uh, gets used pretty loosely in, in our society. Uh, when a ball player runs the ball into the end zone or that driver uh, drives faster, is more strategic on the track than everyone else, or uh, that player makes the three-point jump shot at the buzzer uh, to win the game. We, we often call them or refer to them as our heroes. And in my mind, a uh, hero is not that. A hero is someone that's willing to lay everything on the line for someone else. 
I went to the internet, like any of us would do, to, to justify my thoughts, and, and I was proven wrong, but um, according to dictionary.com, a, a hero is a person noted for courageous acts or nobility of character. I felt pretty good there. I thought I was on the right track. The second, uh, second definition is a person who, in the opinion of others, has special achievements, abilities, or personal qualities, and is regarded as a role model or ideal. Another, uh, another version is a principal male character in a story. And then it went on to hero sandwich, which is another topic for another day. I could have kept looking, I could have justified it, but in my mind, again, there, someone that is willing to risk it all for someone else is a true hero. And, and do we have heroes today? Absolutely. They put on a uniform and go around the world to protect our freedom. They put on heavy gear and oxygen tanks and run into burning buildings. They put on a badge and stand in the face of what is oftentimes pure evil. They put on a stethoscope and go into a room with the sickest of the sick. I think they're heroes today. But the hero that I want to talk about today is beyond all of these. I hate to use the term, but I, I guess you could call him a superhero. When he walked the earth, there was no limit to the healing that he could provide. He controlled the elements. At his word, a, a storm was calmed. He was even able to bring people back from the dead. But it's not these things that made Jesus my hero, our hero. It was his willingness to go to that cross and die so that all of us can live. And not a life here, but a life eternal. I think that's really, truly what makes him the superhero of all time. Before he, he went to that cross, he, he did institute this memorial so that we would always remember. He knows how easily we forget. He took simple bread and simple fruit of the vine, and he, he equated that to his body and his blood that was gonna be broken and shed for us, for our forgiveness, for our life. So as we partake of this, I, I hope that we all reflect on what Jesus truly did and the magnitude of, of his willingness to sacrifice. If you will, please go with me to our Lord in prayer. Lord, we're so thankful that Jesus was willing to, to go to that cross when he could have called 10,000 angels and ended it, but he didn't. Lord, he went willingly and he died that painful, cruel death so that we may live. We're thankful for this bread, Lord, that represents that body that was beaten and broken for us. Lord, we're so thankful for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's go to God in prayer for the fruit for the, for the vine. Lord, again, we're so thankful that Jesus was willing to, to take that punishment, to take that death on that cross so that our sins may be forgiven. Lord, that we may have eternal life with you. We're thankful for this, this cup, this fruit of the vine that represents his blood that was spilled for us. Lord, it's in his holy name that we pray, Christ Jesus. Amen. Separate and apart from the Lord's Supper, this time has been set aside for us to give back a portion of what we've been so richly blessed with. If you missed, there is a contribution box in the foyer if you would like to uh, make a contribution on your way out if you missed that on the way in. We are just so blessed in this country, so blessed here in this congregation, and we just want to give back and give thanks to God for all he's done for us. If you will, go with me to our Lord in prayer. Lord, we're so thankful for the many blessings that you've given us, the spiritual blessings, the monetary blessings, Lord, the blessings of this life. We pray, Lord, as we've given today, that we've done so in a manner that's worthy of all you've done for us. And Lord, we pray that, that those monies will be used to further your work here in this area and, Lord, around the world. And we just pray that 
you'll be with us and, and guide us, Lord. And Lord, keep our hearts focused on you. Lord, we pray all this in your son's holy name. Amen. Number 970. The battle belongs to the Lord. Verses 1, 2, and 3. <coughs> In heavenly armor will enter the land. The battle belongs to the Lord. No weapons that's fashioned against us will stand. The battle belongs to the Lord. some things in life that I cannot know. There are answers that just don't have, or there are questions that just don't have answers on this side of heaven. But there are a lot of things that we can know, and I'm a person who, for better or for worse, at this point in my life, I might begin to categorize it as a character flaw. I don't like not knowing things. If it is something that I could learn relatively easily, I'd like to know about it. But the other day I was reading a book and I came across this name that I had never heard of before. And this book talked about this man a lot, what he said, what he wrote, all these different books and articles that he had written, and I didn't know his name. His name was George Washington Crane. And maybe you know him and I don't, and I'm just in the dark, but I did read up on him after finishing the book. And I must say, I'm, I'm impressed with the life that he lived. He lived an interesting life during an interesting stretch of time. He lived from 1901 to 1995. To put that in perspective, he lived through and was old enough to remember the American Indian Wars, the Banana Wars, the Mexican Revolution, World War I and II, Korea and Vietnam, the Cold War, the Gulf War, and the first time that U.S. boots stepped foot in Iraq. He was around for a while, and during his long life he had a variety of of titles. He was a physician, he was a minister, he was a newspaper columnist, a poet, a clinical psychologist, among other things. He even wrote several campaign speeches for Calvin Coolidge when he was running for office. But what he focused on most was psychology, and he talked a lot about marital advice. He wrote a lot of books on this topic, and in multiple of these books, he would tell variations of the same story about this wife who visited him one day about this wife who was unhappy with her husband, and she needed advice. And I don't know if this story is true or false. Even his children, who are both senators now, I believe, don't know. They have said on record that they don't know if this story is true or false. But the point is, he made a powerful point every single time he told it. The story goes like this. This woman, she comes into his office one day and she comes in with hatred and disgust towards her husband. She says, I do not want to just get rid of my husband. I do not just want to see him gone. I want to make him suffer. 
I want to get even. Before I divorce him, I want to hurt him as much as he has hurt me. Now, Dr. Crane suggested this ingenious plan, or at least I'm sure he thought it was ingenious at the time. He says, go home. Act as if you really love your husband. Tell him how much he means to you. Praise him for every decent trait. Go out of your way to please him, to enjoy him. Make him believe you love him. And after you're done convincing him of your undying love and this idea that you could not ever live without him, then drop the bomb. Walk into the kitchen one morning and say, we're getting a divorce. And that will really hurt him. So with revenge in her eyes, she smiled and said, beautiful. He will be shocked, stunned. She, he won't know what had hit him. And so she began to do it, acting as if for two months that she loved him. She showed him love and kindness. She was listening and giving, reinforcing and sharing. And after two months, she didn't go back to Dr. Crane. So one day, Dr. Crane, realizing that his ingenious plan must have worked, he called her and said, are you ready now to go through with that divorce? And she said, divorce? Never. I could never divorce somebody I truly do love. His point is love starts with action. And her actions had changed her feelings. The ability to love is established not so much by this promise, but by actions repeated over time. And I'll admit, maybe this lesson would have been better suited for February 14th, but it's not Valentine's Day anymore. It's International Workers' Day. Congratulations. Oops. But nonetheless, I have been thinking a lot about love this past week. It's this big thing in the Bible. It's a big part of what and the why and the how and the who that God is. And it's supposed to be a big part of our lives, too. John writes in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, anyone who does not know love does not know God, because God is is love. But when I read verses like this, I ask the same question that Trinidadian German singer Hathaway asked in 1993. I don't know if you know this song or this reference, but he had the song called, What is Love? And that's what I want to talk about this morning. Yes, the Bible says to love, but I want to talk about the who, the what, the how, the why. I want to start off with loving the Lord. You see, Jesus taught us to love the Father. In Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, it says, and he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And this love isn't easy. It's not an easy type of love. Like, I love my dog, and I love pizza, and I love baseball cards. This is a mind, body, and soul kind of love. To love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. And loving with your heart, it's this adoration this deep and personal connection. It's the love we feel towards our family and friends. Loving with your soul is something even deeper than that. It's more than every inch of your body. It's your soul. It's your purpose. It's what drives you. Live life as if your purpose is to show your love to God. And loving with your mind is actually thinking and believing the words that you say. And maybe my struggles are different than yours. But for me, loving with my mind is often where I have trouble. I've been in places and situations in my life where it's easy to quote unquote show love. It's easy to live the life of someone who loves. It's easy to act like you love. But when it comes to believing those thoughts deep in the darkest crevices of your mind, that's where it is hard. But love starts with action. Loving with your mind is just as much about the inward view than it is about the outward actions, and actions is where I start. Jesus goes on to tell us that loving the Father also means loving the Son. In 1 John 5, verse 1, it says, Everyone who believes that Jesus Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father, loves whoever has been born of him. There's no halfway here. This is an all-or-nothing scenario. So often in the world today, especially in the religious world where people are abandoning religious categorization for what they would call spiritualism. They claim to love God. They claim to love what he stands for, but not the rules or the covenants, not the restrictions. But you can't love God and dislike the rules, and you can't love God and dislike his son. Quite the opposite, actually. Jesus tells us that hating the son is also hating the father. 
whomever hates me hates my father also. A disciple of Jesus is one who loves both the father and the son, who loves both the father and what he stands for. A disciple of Jesus is someone who loves God in the same way that he loves us, without restrictions, unconditionally. So the question is, how do we show this type of love to God? And as the answer has been the past few times I've asked it, with action. We love God through the ways in which we worship him, by worshiping in the ways that he asks. In John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, it says, But the hour is coming and is now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. Worship him in spirit with your whole heart, undivided worship. And when I say undivided worship, I don't mean that your mind never wanders during a sermon that already feels too long. That's going to happen. But worship should be about God and only God. It's not about us. It's not about politics or agendas. It's not about what makes us feel good or even what we want to hear. It's about him and his word. Worshiping him in truth means according to what he asks for. It's about keeping these commandments in worship. In John 15, 10, it says, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Unity, this idea that we always are talking about, we're striving for unity within the church. Well, unity isn't based on compromises. Unity isn't based on going halfway. Unity is based in truth. And the truth tells us that we worship God on Sunday mornings and we worship God every other day that we are breathing. In Acts 20, verse 28 says, pay careful attention to you yourselves and to the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. But like we said already, worship isn't just about that Sunday morning experience. That Sunday morning experience is important. It is commanded. It is what God asked for, but it's not the whole story. We see examples throughout the New Testament time and time again about personal worship. To live your life always as if you are worshiping. And Matthew 6, 6 says, When you pray, go into your room and shut the door. Pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Private personal worship is commanded just as much as what we call corporate worship. Private personal worship is just as important, it is just as necessary and it is what God wants, and it is how we show our love to him. But when we look through Scripture, and if you're just to open up a Bible and just underline every single time the word love is used, it's not just talked about loving God. We're also told we have to love the church, that this love of the church is the mark of a true discipleship, is what Jesus says. In John 13, verses 34 and 35, it says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have this love for one another. This is how they know who we belong to, by the way we treat, by the way we talk about, by the way we fellowship with one another. A human body that harms other parts of its body is sick. It's noticeable, it's diagnosable, and it's visible from the outside, and the same is true for the body of Christ. John goes on to elaborate on this. He tells us that this love for one another, this love for the church, this love for fellow disciples, brothers and sisters in Christ, is the sign of a new life. He says, we know that we have passed out of death and into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. We know that we are saved. We know that we have new life. We know that we have obtain salvation because of the ways in which we love each other. But if we do not love each other in the way that Scripture tells us, then we are just as stuck in death as we were before. A disciple of Jesus is one who loves his brothers and sisters in Christ. So again, I asked the question, how do you do this? And the answer, like always, is with action. And we often call this action fellowship. You know, we are supposed to have this fellowship in church. That's what we're doing right now. Hebrews 
chapter 10, verses 24 and 25, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. And I'll admit this verse gets a lot of negative press. We spend a whole lot of time overanalyzing the second half of this verse without even considering the first half. And that's how we stir one another up, the way we encourage one another, the way we help the weaker brother or sister. And that's this, right here and right now. But it's not just about what we do inside this building, because if you've ever been to a doctor or a therapist or a dentist, you would know that the work doesn't stop in the office. The work in the office is often wasted if it's not continued and repeated in the home. Matthew chapter 18, verse 20 says, For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Fellowship isn't just between you and the person that you are with. It involves God. And that is what makes it special. That is what makes it important. That is what makes it love. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11, it says, Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. Now, the church in Thessalonica had their problems. There is no denying that. If you read First and Second Thessalonians, you will see that they struggled in areas, but they did not lack in interpersonal relationships. And I wish that if Paul was here in this room today, he could say this sentence to me. That he would go on and he would teach about building each other up, about encouraging one another, about fellowship, and conclude that sentence with, just as you are doing. Sometimes I don't know if he could. But I do know that is the goal, that is what I strive for, that is the steps that I am taking every single day. But loving God and loving each other isn't enough. That's really the easy part, to love a God who loves you and to love people who think the same way you do. That's easy. It's harder to love those who don't quite think the same that we do, to love those that we call lost. In John chapter 3, 16, we know this verse. It's like a staple verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God certainly had love for the lost. And to love those that hurt you, to love the people that disrespect you, that treat you horribly, is difficult, nearly impossible. And yet that is the standard that we strive for. To love like the Father and the Son. And the Son too surely had love and compassion for those who had rejected him. In Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 35, it reads, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and all the villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. And when he saw the crowds, He had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. There's a lot of amazing things about this passage in the Bible, but the one that sticks out to me is he saw the people who were lost. And he didn't say, that disgusts me, or that makes me angry, or I can't stand to think about people living in that sort of way. No, it says he had compassion for them because they were helpless. They were a sheep without a shepherd. Sometimes I don't know if that's our reaction when we see people who are lost. Is our first gut reaction compassion, hopefully, It is, because Jesus spent this time, he spent lots of time with the people that society told him not to. He loved the sinner. He loved the sick. He loved those who were living lives opposite of his message. And because of that, people responded. He saved souls by loving those that a weaker man would call too far gone. 
That's the bar. That's the example. That is the goal. Paul does something similar, and Paul's often categorized as this hard and harsh man, someone callous from a difficult walk of life. And yet, Paul defines compassion probably better than any human before or after him. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19 through 22, it says, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. This is the definition of in the world, but not of the world. But to actually live that motto, to actually live that message, means you actually have to be in the world, to spend time with, to love, to have compassion for those who do not yet know God. We often get so concerned with protecting our own salvation that we neglect those that don't even know what that word means. But to love the lost means to show them the same olive branch that God has already extended to us. I love how Paul says in the beginning of that verse, he says, for I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all. That this idea that we live not for ourselves, but for others. I think that's what evangelism really is at the heart of it. And Paul says also in Acts chapter 20, verse 24, he says, however, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. If the goal was to only save ourselves, then we could be fiery chariot or escorted up to heaven the second we exited the baptistry. But we're not. We come out of that water and we are still here on earth because we're not just here to save our own skin. We are here for the them, for the others, for the lost. I read this morning this um, statistic that the UN published. It said that within the past 100 years, humans have permanently altered 70% of the earth. And they weren't making this as a good point or a bad point. They listed that we have done both good things and not so good things. But the point was that within just 100 years, we have changed 70% of the earth forever. Humans have a power. God has given us control. God has given us ability to change things. Imagine if we work together, this idea, could we change 70% of hearts and souls? In his book, The Four Loves, C.S. Lewis writes this. This is a quote. I just, I love it. To love it all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly be broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even to an animal. Wrap it carefully or Round with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. The only place outside of heaven where you can be safe from all the dangers of love is hell. For our sake... And for the sake of others, let's choose to live a love filled with action. Let's choose to live a life that is not just about proclaiming love, about talking about it from the inside to this building, or telling people that you love others, but actually doing it. Prove that you love God by the ways in which you worship him. Prove that you love your brothers and sisters by the ways in which you interact with them and prove that you continue to love a lost and dying world 
by the way you attempt to save them, for the compassion that you show them, for the love that you extend to them. If you've been living your life outside of this true love, if you've been living outside of this true, what we call brotherly love, then it's time for a change. If you lack a love for God or for your brother or for your neighbor, then it's time. The Bible tells us that this type of love is accessible, is accessible and it's easy to attain. Steps are easy. We're told to hear and believe God's word. We're told to turn away from and repent of our past sins. This idea that, yes, we have made mistakes in the past and we'll continue to make mistakes in the future. But forgiveness is obtainable when we repent, when we turn away, when we promise to change. We're told to confess our faith in Jesus Christ and be buried with him through baptism into his death, burial, and resurrection. To live a life filled with love, like he did. If you've taken those steps, but still feel as if you're not ready for Christ's return, because he will come back someday, then it's still time for a change. We all fall short. We all fail. We all need prayers and love and compassion that can only be given through fellowship from our brothers and sisters in Christ. Whatever your needs are this morning, I encourage you to come forward as we stand and sing together. to take this opportunity and make a few announcements. Um, I was blessed to be able to go to Peru a uh, week after or week before last and uh, got to see uh, really Christians from the Churches of Christ all over Peru at uh, Pablo Calderon's wedding. And uh, while I was there, I was able to uh, uh, see our missionary, Alex Innocente, uh, and his wife Roxanne and uh, uh, Alex we hadn't we were getting reports um, till about a year and a half ago every month and he was sending the reports to Richard and Valeria Lacante and they were translating them and the reports just mysteriously stopped and uh, so I was talking to Alex and uh, John Farber was uh, translating and um, and by the way, too, Alex and Roxanne earlier this year had COVID real bad. They were both hospitalized, and uh, Alex, I think, almost passed, and he was on a ventilator at one point. They sent him home finally when he didn't get any better on oxygen, and, uh, but now uh, uh, they're both doing excellent, and uh, the church is doing well, uh, and, uh, um, but... Alex, I, I told John, I said, ask him about those reports. And as we're talking, Alex starts looking intently at John. And John starts looking at his phone. I said, John, he's been sending the reports to you, hasn't he? And John goes, yeah, here's like a year's worth of them. So we, we found the missing reports. We don't have them yet, but 
Um, we're we're going to get reports, I think. But keep uh, Alex and Roxanne and the uh, Wacho Church of Christ in your prayers. And uh, we also support Juan Nima and the Los Rosales Church. Uh, uh, so keep keep all those people in your prayers. Uh, they're doing well. And uh, let's see. The I've got an addition to the announcements. The Youngs are leaving uh, for up. They're going up north and going away for the summer. So keep them in in our prayers as they leave. Um, let's see, this morning after uh, morning services, uh, the widow, widow, widower's luncheon, uh, Janet, uh, see Janet Rubio for details on that. She told me where y'all are going for lunch, I forget. Cracker Barrel, okay, so see Janet uh, for that. Uh, Help us celebrate our four graduates next Sunday night after evening services. And uh, the graduates are Lexi Benvenia, uh, J.R. Main, Devin Jordan, and Jasmine. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Good thing I'm back in this country. Uh, so. I can't pronounce anything. Um, but our four graduates, if you want to leave them a card, there's, some, uh, uh, there's a place out in the uh, foyer uh, if you want to leave the graduates uh, a card. Uh, all right, the next men's breakfast is May 21st. Uh, sign up in the foyer if you plan to attend for that. Uh, keep in your prayers as we're planning for uh, vacation Bible school. VBS will be June 26th through the 29th. Uh, we need volunteers of all sorts ready to step up this year. Need teachers for all classes, volunteers to help with activities, and just a general need for all hands on deck. See Jim or Emily uh, Benvenia if you can help. And finally, there'll be a wedding shower for Haley uh, Frazier here at the church building on May 21st. At 2 p.m. and I think that's all the announcements I have. Number 888. Thank you, Lord. Verses 1, 2, and 3. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for blessing me. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Let us pray together. Father, we thank you for this day, for this time that we could assemble together as a family, as your children. Father, we are so grateful for your word, especially that reminded us this morning of love. Father, although we don't understand why you love us so much, we are still grateful for your love, for your grace and your mercy. We pray, Father, that we will 
go through this week and show that love to others. Father, we are mindful of those who are sick. Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters all over the world, especially those missionaries, Father, that has given up so much to share your word. We pray that you'll continue to bless us so we can provide for them. Father, we are so thankful for your son who died on a cross for the forgiveness of our sins. It is in his name we pray. Amen.